Everyone has questions. Why am I here? Where will I go when I die? Is there really truth? But not everyone has biblical answers. Welcome to The Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study the Bible to draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is Pastor Tom Brock. Welcome to The Pastor Study. Let me tell you the story for the day. It's about 860 B.C., wicked King Ahab and his equally wicked wife Jezebel are ruling over Israel. This is the most wicked couple of the Old Testament. King Ahab wants his neighbor Naboth's vineyard. Naboth says, I'm not going to sell it to you. This has always been in my family. It always will. I'm not selling. Ahab starts pouting. He won't eat dinner. Jezebel says, what's wrong? Well, Naboth won't sell me his vineyard. And she says, do you now rule over Israel? I'll get you this vineyard. She has things set up so that the elders of Naboth's town stone him to death. And she says, Ahab, go get your vineyard. Ahab and Jezebel head into the vineyard to take possession and God sends Elijah the prophet to confront them. That's the story we're going to look at today. Would you turn with me in the Old Testament to 1 Kings chapter 21 and let's pray first. Father, we look at the days when evil people were ruling Israel. We have many nations in our world that are being run by evil people that don't care for you and they throw Christians in prison and only you know what's going to happen in the United States. So, Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 21, starting at verse 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, that's the prophet. First lesson today, sometimes God sends a prophet. The prophet Elijah is sent now to confront Ahab and Jezebel. 150 years earlier, the prophet Nathan was sent to King David to confront him for his adultery and murder. And sometimes, especially when grievous sin is going on, God send you a prophet. So let me ask, when God sends you a prophet, do you listen? I can think of this young man that used to go to the church I served for many years. When he got into his teenage years, he got into alcohol, drugs, sexual sin. There was a dear woman of our church who would spend time with him, counsel him, urge him to Christ. He wouldn't listen, and he was found dead at age 21 of alcohol. And why did he die early? Because he wouldn't listen to the prophet that God has put in his life. Again, let me ask you, do you listen to the people, the prophets that God has put into your life? Look at verse 18. The Lord says to Elijah the prophet, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. Next lesson. Sometimes God steps in. You know, often God lets evil people just do their thing, but sometimes God says, Enough, I'm going to step in. That's about to happen here. You can disagree with me on this, but I think things like the coronavirus, tsunamis, 9-11, AIDS, herpes, hurricanes can be God's way of stepping in. Did you know, you know the big tsunami uh, a number of years ago now? Do you know that is where child prostitution was highest on the planet? They also, that, that area of the world persecutes the Christian church the worst. And you could say the tsunami was a coincidence, but sometimes God steps in. L look at verse 19. And you shall speak to him, Elijah, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? 
And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, the dogs shall lick up your blood, even yours. Now can you imagine poor prophet Elijah having to give that message to the king? Here's the next lesson. Be willing to say the hard word. If God is moving you to have a difficult conversation with someone, say your prayers and go do it. Years ago, there was a, a difficult older man that came to my church regularly. He was an angry guy, to be honest. He was spooky. He, he uh, intimidated me. And then one of his relatives said, well, he swears like a sailor when he gets out the door of the church. He tr has a terrible drinking problem. And now he's living with his girlfriend. Well, then one of his relatives said, he's probably dying. Would you please go to the hospital? And I did. And it was hard because this guy was difficult. So I drove over there and I went into the hospital room to say the hard word and I said, well, Mr. So-and-so, I've been told you've got a drinking problem and 1 Corinthians 6 says drunkards don't go to heaven and you're living with your girlfriend. 1 Corinthians 6 says fornicators don't go to heaven. So I just want to urge you to turn to Christ and ask his forgiveness. And he didn't say a thing, but the anger in his eyes was there. Well, he lived. <laughs> a few more years. Never came back to church. I called him, but you could tell he didn't want to talk. He died a while ago. I don't know if he ever repented or not, but I'm sure glad I had the hard talk. I can sleep at night. And if God is calling you to have a gift, difficult talk with someone, just pray and do it. Look at verse 19. The place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, the dogs shall lick up your blood, King Ahab, even yours. Here's the next lesson. You reap what you sow. If you reap bloodshed like Ahab did, you get bloodshed on you like Ahab did. New Testament says the same thing. Galatians chapter 6, do not be, be deceived. Whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. If you sow to your flesh, your evil nature, you will from your flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to the Holy Spirit, from the Spirit you shall reap eternal life. You reap what you sow, as the old saying goes, what goes around comes around. Verse 20, And Ahab said to, to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? Here's the next lesson. Ahab doesn't know who his enemies are. He thinks Elijah is the enemy. He's not. He's trying to get him to God. He's trying to save him. Ahab's enemy is Ahab. Ahab's enemy is Jezebel. I got an email this week. Pastor Brock, you are such a disgrace. You are so filled with hate. Uh, earlier I got a different email. Pastor Brock, you are so uneducated and narrow to think that only Christianity is, is the way to heaven. There are many paths. And, and, you know, I, I, reading those, I can tell these people think I'm the enemy. I'm not. I'm trying to get them to Christ. <laughs> you know who their enemies are? The people that are telling them, make up your own way to God. Do whatever you want. Those are their enemies. I, uh, I was jogging. And I'm, I'm jogging. Uh, and here is uh, kind of in an open field with a lot of Canadian geese. And as I'm jogging, I see a fox coming in the distance toward the geese. And he walks right in the middle of the geese, and the geese just stand there on the ground. And he walked all the way through this big, he didn't attack them, but the, the, the geese just sat there. <laughs> then I come jogging along. When I got close to the geese, they just flew all over the place. <laughs> and you know, I'm thinking, those geese don't know who their enemy is. I don't even like goose meat. But I'm not their enemy. But Christian, the people that are trying to get you to Christ are your friends. The people who are trying to make you comfortable in your sin, those are your enemies. Even if they smile. Look at verse 20. 
And Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? He said, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon you, and will utterly sweep you away, and will cut off from Ahab every male, both slave and free, in Israel. Here's the next lesson. God brings disaster. Uh, uh, look again at verse 21. God says this to uh, Ahab, I will bring disaster upon you. In other words, we got to get rid of this belief that God is this big marshmallow who wouldn't hurt a fly. Au contraire. God brings disaster in the Old Testament. And he does it in the New Testament too. Read 1 Corinthians 11. People are getting drunk on Holy Communion. It says God's killing them. <laughs> Oh, but my loving God wouldn't do that, Pastor. Well, read your Old and New Testaments. Sometimes he does. Verse 22. And I will make God speaking through the prophet to King Ahab. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. These are kings that were worshiping Baal. Because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and because you have made Israel sin. Here's the next lesson. Don't provoke God to anger. Those kings just mentioned were worshiping idols and they were kind of just, okay, God, let's see what you can do. <laughs> Let me ask you. Are you provoking God to anger? I think if you've got marijuana in your house, crack in your house, cocaine, some substance, I think you're provoking God to anger. Men, do you have pornography in your house or in your car or on your computer? I think that's provoking God to anger. I don't get Showtime and Stars and HBO, the, these scuzzier networks in my house, because I don't turn the TV off as quick as I should. And the, the, the other, re I mean, I don't have, uh, I have on my iPhone something called Covenant Eyes. It's also on my laptop to protect myself from getting pornography, because I'm, I'm not all that strong. So um, I encourage you, don't provoke God to anger. If, if there's something that God is telling you to get rid of for your sake, for your health and happiness, get rid of it. <laughs> Look at the last part of verse 22. And because you made Israel to sin. Here's the next lesson. Beware of causing others to sin. Abraham just didn't worship idols himself. He got Israel to do it, the whole people. You know, I've shared this before. My dad kept boxes of pornography in the garage. I found that stuff when I was nine years old. Parents, your sins can affect your children. I think the Minneapolis and St. Paul public schools are provoking God to anger. They now have these gay support groups in the schools run by practicing homosexuals, telling teenagers nothing's wrong with homosexuality. Just before the camera started rolling, uh, our director told me there's a, 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 a story in today's Star Tribune of, what was the name of that town? Caledonia, Minnesota, that has one of these clubs or groups for inclusivity, of, uh, but not of the right, it's of the left. And the, the Christian coach said, I think homosexuality is wrong. He is getting so plum, pummeled with criticism right now. <sighs> Jesus said, better to have a millstone around your neck and be thrown into the ocean than to cause children to stumble. Verse 23. And of Jezebel also has the Lord spoken, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel in the district of Jezreel. And the one belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dog shall eat. And the one who dies in the fields, the birds of heaven shall eat. Surely there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the sight of the Lord, because Jezebel his wife incited him. And he acted very abominably in following idols, according to all that the Ammonites had done, whom the Lord cast out before the sons of Israel. Now here's the surprise, semi-happy ending. Look at verse 23. Excuse me, verse uh, 27. 
And it came about when Ahab heard these words that he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth. He fasted and he lay in sackcloth and he went about despondently. The Lord then said to Elijah the Tishbite, Do you see how Ahab humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but I will bring the evil upon his house in his son's days. So here's the next lesson. Humble yourself and fast. Ahab fasted and humbled himself. Do you ever fast? Uh, I, I was interviewing someone for the radio. He was in the homosexual lifestyle. Hasn't been in there for eight years. He's following Christ. But he says, I still get tempted. And there are certain days I know I have to fast or I'm going to fall. I, I want to encourage you, consider doing this. Take 24 hours. You drink water during a fast. But go for 24 hours without food. And just take that time to seek the Lord. God does stuff when we fast. And then the happy ending is God says, I'm going to put off the disaster. It's not going to happen in Ahab's time. There's the next lesson. God is merciful. If you will humble yourself, God will forgive you. You know, if someone said, you know, will God forgive my abortion? Yes, if you humble yourself, ask for forgiveness, and come to Christ. There's no sin he doesn't forgive. But you need to humble yourself, and you need to come to Christ. The good news of this depressing story is God forgave Ahab. He was merciful. But I call it a semi-happy ending because the ultimate ending is not happy. Here's how Ahab died. Here we go. This is from 1 Kings 22, verse 34. There was a battle. A certain man drew his bow at a venture and struck the king of Israel, Ahab, between the scale armor and the breastplate. The king died, the blood of the wound flowed into the bottom of his chariot. So the king died and was brought to Samaria. They buried the king in Samaria, and they washed the chariot by the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood, and the harlots washed themselves in it, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken earlier through Elijah. So here's the last lesson, and this is why it's a sad ending for Ahab. Repentance is a continual lifestyle not a one-time act. Um, King Ahab did repent for a while, and God spared him. But then eventually he went back to his life of rebellion, and then God killed him. Repentance is not something you do 10 years ago. It's something you do every day. <laughs> um, I got a phone call. A person said, oh, Pastor Tom, I have a problem with these people who pray and ask Jesus into their heart. And then they live as evil as everybody else. And I said, we should have trouble with that. Um, repentance is not something you do once. It's a, I mean, Martin Luther wrote 500 years ago, quote, What is the daily significance of baptism? That I should daily drown my old Adam, my old evil nature, and daily rise a new person in Christ. It's a battle. I have to fight my flesh every day. I don't win every battle. But when I lose and I sin, I repent, I ask for forgiveness, I get back up and I get back in the, Bible, in the battle because repentance is a lifelong, continual thing. I'll close with this. I, I knew a man who had a drinking problem for years. Then he came to Christ, started going to AA every Friday night. He got to be an old man, a number of years of sobriety. But he said to me, I've had a number of years now where I've been fine, but I still get tempted, and I know if I don't go to my Friday night meeting, I could be in trouble. And he's with the Lord now. He died some years ago. But that's the Christian life. The Christian life is you don't pray a prayer 10 years ago, and now you go back to living your life of sin. Daily, we have a continual battle with the flesh, and if you don't, if you go back to your old ways and you live in that, you'll end up like Ahab. But if you do what this friend of mine did, you'll end up with the Lord. We're saved by repentance and faith in Christ. You've got to have both to be saved. That is what we learn from Ahab. Welcome to the portion of the pastor study where we ask Pastor Brock questions regarding the Bible. 
Pastor Brock, our first question is, what happened to Ahab's kingdom? King Ahab was king of Israel, which is the northern half of Israel. And after Ahab and eventually the Jews got so idolatrous that God brought in the king of Assyria who wiped them out in 722 BC. Southern Israel is called Judah. They remained for quite a while, but same problem. They went after idolatry. So in 586 BC, God brought in the king of Babylon who took the Jews to Babylon for 70 years and then God let the Jews come back home. Hmm. Yeah. How do I respond to someone who says, I know my loving Jesus would never send anyone to hell? I would respond by quoting Jesus himself in John chap Matthew chapter 25, depart from me you evildoers into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. There you've got Jesus telling people, go to hell. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people worship the Jesus of their imagination rather than the Jesus of Scripture. We're not free to dream up what we think Jesus is all about. Jesus lived and died and revealed to us who he was. So those people don't know the Bible. I'm sorry, that's just the truth, yeah. Jesus said we are to judge not. So why should I ever confront someone about their sin when I have enough sins of my own? And, and so do I, I have enough sins of my own too. That's why Jesus said, before you go to correct someone, make sure about the log in your own eye that you've dealt with that. But then he does say, first do this and then still do it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, Mona, I think the worst, most misquoted verse in the Bible is, judge not lest mm -hmm. ye be judged. Jesus did not mean by that, that we aren't to know what's right and wrong and that we're never to talk to someone about their sin. Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. <laughs> and also the same Jesus who said, judge not, said, this is from Matthew chapter, John chapter seven, judge with righteous judgment. Mm -hmm. So there's a, I think judge not simply means don't think you're superior or better than anybody else. I think that's what that means. But, but he also says in John seven, judge with righteous judgment. Both are true. Okay. Yeah. Isn't it best to say that God allows disasters, but that he doesn't cause them? But the Bible says sometimes God causes them. Amos chapter three, if a disaster comes against a city, has not the Lord done it? And in the book of Acts, King Herod is being evil. It says the angel of the Lord slew him. Uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, people are getting drunk on Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. Paul says that's why some of you are sick and dying. So God does do this kind of stuff, yeah. Another question, please explain more about fasting. Yeah, you know, we mentioned fasting in the sermon and fasting is when you take some time not to eat food. Generally you do still drink water uh, and maybe there's liquid fast where you can also have apple juice or something. But it's a time just to get away from food. Food can be an idol. I mean, I think about eating all day long. Mm -hmm. That's one reason to fast. And so we, we take maybe 24 hours, we don't eat food, and we just spend that time. Sometimes I fast for, and I gotta admit, I don't fast nearly like I used to, I should probably get back to it. But sometimes you fast because you have a question. Lord, what do I do about this mm -hmm. situation? In fact, I'll tell you this, I did a, a, one of the longest fasts I've ever done because I had a question for the Lord. And this was kind of uncanny, right when the time was up for me fasting so I could eat again. I was having a conversation with a Christian woman and without her even knowing what she said, she gave me the answer to my question. Mm -hmm. So I think God can do that. So everybody think about fasting. It's, it's in the New Testament. Jesus didn't say if you fast, he said when you fast. So, yeah. Does it have to be a certain amount of time? It's uh, however you feel led. You know, I, there are people that do five day fasts where they just drink water. Uh, check with your doctor, but most people can handle that, but check with your doctor first, yeah. But that's ex kind of extreme. Uh, 24 hours is more normally what I have done, mm -hmm. but I've done longer fasts, yeah. I've even heard of like from sun up to sundown. Yep. What do you think about uh, that? That's a good way too, mm -hmm. sure. Okay. Yep. Will God forgive me if I keep doing the same sin over and over again? Well, <clears throat> Jesus, uh, Peter said, Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive this guy? Seven times a day? And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. So if I have to forgive you 490 times a day, Mona, I believe the Lord is doing at least that much for us. 
Um, and then, so if you've sinned, and uh, if it's the 15th time you've done it, or 100th, or, if you come to the Lord sorry for your sin, not wanting to do it again, then you claim 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then I like the Ephesians 1, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, for in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Yes, God forgives us all of our sins. Now, on the other hand, if I'm living in a sin, mm -hmm. I'm not repentant. I mean, if somebody, somebody has sex with their boyfriend, if they're sorry, they're repentant, they're forgiven. If they're living with their boyfriend, mm -hmm. eh. But Paul says, 1 Corinthians 6, fornicators don't go to heaven. So you, you need to have a repentant heart. So you can, can you have the attitude where I'll, I'll do it, but then I'll just ask for forgiveness that, the again? Prob the problem with that attitude, mm -hmm. I, and I'm, I, yeah, and I think I've had that attitude in my life. The problem with that attitude, you reap what you sow. God can forgive you, mm -hmm. but you have to put up with the consequences of your sin. So that's a really stupid way to think. I, and I'm not saying I haven't done it, I mm -hmm. have. But yeah, so uh, don't go that route. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, will Old Testament people who died before Christ, will they be in heaven? Yeah, some people wondered that because they died <laughs> before Jesus died on the cross. So how are their sins forgiven if Christ hadn't died yet? Well, I believe Christ's death was retroactive. It covered this Old Testament believers like Abraham. And we know Jesus said, you will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So we will see the Old Testament believers in heaven. I think Christ's death retroactively saved them. Okay. Yeah. Will I know my loved ones in heaven? Yeah, we get that question a lot. Well, I know there's grandma and there's my father. Or whatever. I think you will. The reason? Because of the verse I just quoted. You will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in heaven. Well, if I'm going to know... Well, there's Abraham. I think God's going to, well, there's grandma, you know. So I think you will know your loved ones. So will I know who Moses is? Will I know? I think you will, because that's what he said. You will see Abraham. Somehow God will give us wisdom to know there's Abraham. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That'll be a day. <laughs> that will be an exciting day. <laughs> yeah. Pa Pastor Brock, do you have any? Well, we're out of time, everybody. Oh. Sorry. See you next week. Bye. Thank you for watching the Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the gospel of Christ because of our generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org. Or write the Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always. If you've been blessed by the pastor's study, would you consider a tax-deductible gift to help us reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ? You can donate at our website, pastorstudy.org, two S's, or mail a check to the pastor's study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55441. May the Lord bless you and have a wonderful week.